Hey, everybody. You doing all right? It's not intimidating at all to get up after Dr. Scott Hahn. I remember the first time I'd tell this story really quick. I remember one of the first times I ever heard the voice of, of Dr. Hahn. It was on my answering machine at work. And uh, I'll, 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 play, I'll play a song. I'm gonna, I'll play a few songs uh, throughout, throughout this because I can't talk for 50 minutes. <laughs> Um, not say anything meaningful anyways. Um, but I remember I'd, I'd released this, my first album, and there's a song on there that I'll share in a bit that was inspired by a book he'd written called The Lamb's Supper. And um, Bob Rice uh, was kind enough to hand the CD over to Dr. Hahn. And so I, it's like, you have four messages. You know, and it's like, hey, Matt, it's Deacon Jim. Don't forget about baptisms. You know, it was just sort of a list of, you know, typical things. And then all of a sudden it's like, Matt. This is Dr. Hahn. And I was, my first thought, is that really his voice? I just, I can't imagine being in theology class, you know what I mean? And he's like, hypostatic union. It's just, it, it's like the movie trailers guy, you know what I mean? One pope, one church, one baptism. Anyways, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble later. I really just want to spend some time and just kind of share with you my story. I, I've, I've really come to believe that in the day and age in which we live, um, aside from the rich deposit of faith, the treasure of the sacramental life that we have as Catholics to share with the world, individually, the most powerful thing as a starting point that each and every one of us has to share is our story. I mean, the, really, when you look at salvation in history, it's the greatest story ever written. And it's the story of God. It's the story of his love for the very people he made in his image and likeness, that he's loved, that he's called into relationship for eternity. And that's the story that you and I are part of. And it's really the only story worth attaching your life to. But when we do that, our story takes on such a powerful, powerful dimension. And it doesn't matter what you've been through in your life. It doesn't matter how dramatic or how simple. Each and every one of us, because of Jesus, has now a legacy that we're, and a story that we're a part of that's just amazing. I grew up in Newfoundland, Canada. I was, yeah, okay, a couple of Canadians. Awesome. Yeah. I'll pay you your loonies later. Um, I grew up in Canada in an Irish Catholic home. My father, uh, he grew up Catholic. He went to seminary when he was a kid for two years. and Luckily, that didn't work out because I'm here. So I appreciate that. He met my mother. She was an American who, uh, who was going to college and was singing in a folk choir. And they got a grant from the USO to tour all the American naval bases. And they ended up going to Canada to a naval base in Argentia, Newfoundland. And she met my dad. And my dad fell in love with her. And she almost missed her flight, which would have been bad because they were going to Greenland. And they ended up falling in love and getting married. And Newfoundland's a, a beautiful place, a very rich history, very rich tradition, very rich culture. And the church has massive roots there. And so I grew up going to Catholic school. I went to Catholic school my whole life. It was public back then. It was funded, but actually it was supported by the government. So I went to a public Catholic schools through K through 12. And uh, ninth, freshman year of high school, I switched to a Jesuit high school. And it was a fantastic environment. We had the largest volunteer ministry program in Atlantic Canada of young people who went and served at all these different amazing venues at old age homes and soup kitchens. And But a tragic thing happened. I went through 12 years of education, and most of my relationship with God was formed in the first four or five grades. I learned to pray when I was about four, you know, when I was young. But my prayer life never really evolved because it was never really encouraged to. I'm sure it's a similar story as, as many people in here. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just is how it is. So I graduated from Catholic school in 1992, believing in God, kind of, but kind of went off to college and just kind of pretty soon got swept up in a, really was the beginning stages of relativism. And three years into college, my 
my home life kind of deteriorated. My parents got divorced. I moved from Newfoundland to Phoenix, which is proof that God has a sense of humor. If you ever needed to know, I grew up in an island surrounded by water, and then I ended up in a giant sea of beige. I remember we moved. It was it was July the 3rd because I got there that night, and I woke up the next morning. And I'm like, it's the 4th of July. We're in, we're in Arizona. Let's go blow stuff up because that's what you do in Arizona. And my cousin's like, no, we're going to go to Mass. And I said, what? Mass? I haven't been. I haven't been there in quite a while. And uh, she's like, when's the last time you went? I was like, oh, it's probably Christmas. I was a CEO, you know, Christmas and Easter only. That's <laughs> kind of what I did. You come twice a year, pay your respects, drop five bucks in the collection plate. You, you feel better about life. And that was pretty much it. And so I went to church with her, and I, I, can't, I couldn't tell you how great the music was or wasn't. I remember the keyboard player had a mullet. That's what I remember. It was long. It was like it was like 80s movie long. That, and I couldn't tell you what the pastor preached about. I'm sorry, fathers who are here, priests who are here. I couldn't. I don't remember the homily. What I do remember was the people. When he said, the Lord be with you, back then they said, and also with you. But actually, they said it audibly. And there were people of all ages. There was families. There was young people. There were tons of teenagers. There were college students. There were older people there. Everybody was active. Everybody was responding. Even the silence captured my attention for the first time ever in my life. And so it was a powerful thing. And I begin to be witnessed to what real faith looks like not through a program or not through some one dynamic individual. It was really just through a community. It was through a community of people who all believed in the richness of the Catholic faith, but all had a relationship with Jesus. And they were all across the spectrum back then. This is 1995. So there were people, you know, people were arguing about politics all the time. But at the end of the day, what the church taught was what the church taught. And, and, and that didn't change. You could argue about other stuff. And within the boundaries of this Catholic parish, just a normal Catholic parish, was a charismatic community. And so I hung out with my cousin and all of her friends. All of my cousin's friends grew up in a charismatic covenant community. Christianity, the idea of it was so crazy to me that the idea of being open to the Holy Spirit wasn't that much crazier. Paul says the cross is, is foolishness to the world. But we know it's the power of God. And so by the end of that summer, I had a massive conversion. And I went from being a guy who was kind of like cool with whatever. I had an astrological pendant sign around my neck. To all of a sudden, I was going to Mass three times a week. I was reading Bud McFarlane books. Yeah, people... I'd, I had thrown away all my secular CDs. I was like on a retreat, and I was helping out with the youth program. I didn't know anything really concrete about the faith. I didn't even know that the thing, a thing existed called the catechism. I never knew that until I was 20. I mean, it's kind of crazy, but it was all, it was all new. But what I had was my heart, and that's, just the, that's what I gave to Jesus in service of the church. And I could play music. That was the one thing I was always good at. Um. So I got involved in the parish life, and I played music, played at the children's mass once a month, and then the rest of it I hung out, and I'd go to the youth group. The, the youth minister let me hang out. It was, I mean, I look back on it now and go, wow, he took a big risk. But sometimes you have to take a risk on people. Sometimes, like Jesus, you're going to look at a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and, and see beneath the surface and see the potential of who they are. So I got involved in ministry, and I started going to school part-time. I'd moved from Arizona. I could only afford one credit hour. And here I am, this sort of renewed Catholic. I mean, I remember where I went to confession for the first time, and I said, bless me, Father. It's, for I've sinned, it's been eight, nine years since my last confession, and I proceeded to say stuff. And he said, whoa, that's a lot of blank. And he didn't say blank. And I tell you what, that was the best thing he could have said f for someone in my situation because shame is a powerful thing. 
And there, you have no idea how many people in your life or in your communities dare not grace the doors of a church because of shame and guilt. But what I experienced was the total opposite. And so I got involved in my parish, and then I was going to the largest state-sponsored school in the country, Arizona State University, which is also the biggest party school in the country. And it was such a crazy dynamic because I was super involved in my parish life. And then I would go practice, and I was a jazz major. Let me tell you something. Jazz is an amazing art form. But for a lot of people who play jazz, it's like a religion. And so right away, there was this tension in my life of who do I belong to? Whose am I? And it wasn't just this clean-cut thing of like, I'm sold out, I'm here. It was a constant tug of war in a way. Even though my, I knew my identity was slowly becoming more securely rooted in Christ, rooted in the church, the more I found out about the lives of the saints. This is all within the first span of a year and a half of my life. I knew... I still felt the tug of the world. And something changed in about a year and a half into living in Arizona. I met a man named Rich Mullins. He was a Christian uh, singer-songwriter. And who had, he's the guy who wrote, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wind. There you go. He hated that song, by the way. <laughs> That's the funny thing about, uh, he, I mean, the chorus is great, but he never liked the verses because, you know, I think you get to a point later on in life where you realize sometimes you trivialize God. Like when he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the Ritz. That was cool for a time. Um, but I got to know him. He, he'd written a musical. He was on this journey. He'd moved to Window Rock, Arizona. There was an Indian reservation. And what inspired that was the life and the ministry and legacy of St. Francis. Rich was so impacted by the legacy of his life, his response to Jesus, his response to the church, that he, he just packed everything up and left and moved to an Indian reservation. He was teaching kids music education and then also teaching them about Jesus. And then he was on this sort of this journey towards learning about Catholicism. And by this point, I was so firmly entrenched in my faith that I was convinced I could convert Rich Mullins. So I got cast in this musical as sort of Rich's earthly character. What he did, what Rich did in a, in a clever way, it's, it's the story of St. Francis set in the Wild West. And so what Rich did was he separated himself into two people. One was a guy named Frank, and the other one was named Ivory. And Ivory was a piano player who played his way in a saloon and made a living. I paid my way through college the first three years by playing piano in a hotel bar. It was like spiritual typecasting. So I hung out for a month with this guy, Rich Mullins, and he made such a profound impact on my life. And the funny thing was, I didn't even know, I had only heard one song. I'd never heard any of his music. It was just who he was as a person and who he invited, what he drew out of people. It was amazing. And so I remember uh, he, he, it was during Thanksgiving I used to smoke, and we'd go outside and have cigarettes and, and kind of chat about stuff. And I said, so how come you're not going to be a Catholic yet? And he's like, and it was always, you know, it was, uh, I just don't get the Pope. He's like, I get, he's like, Mary, she's cool with me. And I understand it all. He's like, but I just don't understand. And so I remember that was, it was 1997. It was the beginning, it was 96. It was going to be the beginning of, you know, the three-year pilgrimage really leading up to the Golden Jubilee year. And, and they'd released John Paul II's sort of teachings on all three years into a book. And so I bought the book, and I remember Rich played it at New Year's Eve, and I gave him this book, thinking to myself, you're going to read this, and, and I'm going to convert you, and nothing. But an amazing thing happened about another nine months after that, was I kind of heard through the grapevine that Rich had finally heard the Holy Spirit lead him. And he decided he was going to become Catholic. And then he died in a car accident. And sometimes I wonder at the time, it's all a mystery. I don't really understand. But God does. But the funny thing about it is that I learned about a saint more from a Protestant 
than I did anybody else. And it started a process in me. And God just sort of continued it. It wasn't a thing I, at the time I wasn't even knowledgeable of it. I went on and finished my college degree. I ended up at a very large Catholic parish called St. Timothy's in Mesa, Arizona. It's the parish that founded Life Teen. It was a very, very dyna dynamic parish. Life Teen is a youth ministry that it's in over 1,000, almost 2,000 parishes now around the world, helping kids understand their Catholic faith. So I was involved with this ministry. I was involved with the youth ministry. I started writing music. I was trying to figure out. I'd gone from this small parish to this massively huge parish, and I was trying to figure out my identity. And serving in a parish, the great thing about it was that in some ways, all the efforts of my ego didn't really matter. It was very utilitarian. So we'd be like, we're doing a retreat. They need a theme song for the retreat. And so I had to say, well, what's the theme song about? And I remember, and they were like, it's about family. I'm like, cool. And they're like, yeah, we've been reading Scott Hahn, and he's and this whole talk he gives about how God is a family. And so we, we're going to do a retreat about this with our teenagers. And so this song kind of came out. Lord, hear me. I am open. I surrender all my sin, all my pride. Gets me nowhere, leaves me stranded, empty handed. So shatter the darkness in my life as I carry this cross both day and night. All the confess to you Jesus and to you my brothers and sisters I have sinned need forgiveness pray for me and I for you so share So we just started trying to write songs to help articulate my faith and the faith of the community that I was part of. And, and some were good and some were terrible. They were. And all along I kept write, trying to write songs about women and they were terrible because I didn't know anything about women. 
the, but the problem was I thought I did. See, that's the thing. The first ru rule of songwriting is you write about what you know. And so then it was this kind of this, I think, period of life where I was, my brain started to wake up. See, my heart had been awakened, and then the journey 18 inches upward happened. You know, for some people it happens in reverse. And so I started, you know, trying to read many books, and then I, I, I read The Lamb's Supper. And at our parish, and at that time, confirmation class, you know, was for high school juniors, and, and whenever they'd give the talk on the Eucharist, they'd always say, transubstantiation. Now there's a word you'll never hear in a song. And so... I thought, why not? Transubstantiation Heaven kisses earth We become a living town Wisdom be attentive, steady my shaking mind. Let this be my reality, more than just spread and wine. This is the end and the beginning. This is the eighth day of creation. One with the saints and angels in our song. <laughs> oh, man. I haven't played that in a long time. Um, so, I, I mean, I did. I put out the CD. It was just from my parish. I really wasn't thinking anything about it. And I was kind of, in some ways, I think, was just inspired by a lot of different things. It's funny. I won't play it just for, for the sake of time. But I wrote this other song called Just Like You. It was inspired by St. Francis. And in 2000, you know, we went to World Youth Day in Rome, and a couple of, you know, we all took our group to Assisi one day, and everyone else went down in the valley to go see another church. And a good friend of mine took me and, and one other guy and said, hey, we're going to go up to the mountaintop, to Francis's mountaintop retreat, you know. So we go up there, and there we walk into this room where there's this sort of carved out rock bed, you know, where Francis used to sleep on. It's, you know, it's very, you know, sort of aesthetic. You, you just... You know what I mean? You're like, could I do that? Um, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I start hearing the song that I wrote. And I'm like, it's like it's just playing in the ether, you know? And I'm like, what? This is, oh, man, this is weird. It's, Francis, do you love my song? What's? And then my, my buddy's like, dude, your CD player is playing in your backpack. He who exalts himself will be humbled. <laughs> but really, I mean, it's, it's, it's so amazing looking back now that so much, I think, happened in such a short period of time, compressed in a way. And I graduated from college in 99, and I dove headlong into full-time ministry because I was tempted with health insurance. I was deathly afraid. Of, I didn't want to be a professional Christian. It's just the idea, like, I think especially a lot of my heroes, my Catholic heroes, you know, were were people who are impacting the greater culture. You know, part of our worldview as Catholics is that we're kind of called to go into the world and kind of point out where the hand of God is already at work. To point out what's good, what's true, and what's beautiful. And here I was kind of in this other world, and it was, it was great, but it, it felt sometimes I struggled because it felt safe. It felt safe. An interesting thing happened in about 2003. I wrote a song while I was on treatment for a virus called hepatitis C. I had it for, at that time, I had it for um, 17 years. I got it from a blood transfusion when I was a child. And uh, it was a difficult time. If you don't know anybody who's uh, 
gone through interferon therapy, it it's it's different because even especially if you're only 26, 27 years old, you can walk around, you can move around. But I lost 35, 40 pounds. My hair turned gray, and uh, it was a difficult time for me emotionally. But but it was a very prolific time. And uh, so I wrote this song kind of as a lamentation. I'd been going to a Bible study at our church and uh, at our parish, and the man who was teaching it had been, he taught at La Colbe Bibliotheque in, in Israel. He taught English to a lot of the Messianic scholars. And he taught the narrative of the scriptures. And we were learning a lot about how in the Old Testament, how God reveals himself identified in the relationships that he keeps, but the way that he relates. So when you hear the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, it's God reminding people of his relationship and the way that he relates to people. And I love Jacob because Jacob had the audacity to wrestle. And uh, so sitting on my friend's covered porch one day with a Bible in one hand, a guitar in the other, this little song came out. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. You yeah, have sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is now, your grace is now, your grace is now for children remember your promise oh God we sing that together your grace your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me you know at the time I was writing a lot of me. Oh, thank you. I was. Uh, I should say too. The other thing that happened during that time was I was dating somebody and we broke up. So it, it, yeah, it was a breakup song. I just, I just redirected. That's it's important to do. That's it's a spiritual discipline, people. Um, 
was right around that time. I was writing a lot of music, but, you know, it was also at a time where there was a lot of shifting and changing in this church, a lot of uh, conversations about liturgy. I, I fell in love with the Mass. It was one of the first things that I think intrigued me. I loved it the most. I, I was obsessed with film scoring as a kid, so I loved the idea of, like, how the Mass sort of plays out all of salvation history, and music can sort of heighten the natural flow of what happens in a liturgy. It's, it, it's funny that a Catholic Mass is one of the most dynamic things, yet could also seemingly be one of the most inhospitable things for somebody who doesn't have a clue to attend. But if it's prayed well, like I'd experienced so many years before, there wasn't anything extra. There wasn't, it wasn't necessarily loud. There wasn't rock and music. It was just the people of God assembled to hear the word, to receive Jesus in the Eucharist, to be changed and transformed, to bear witness to the prayers and the legacy of those who have gone before, that was enough. But it inspired me as a musician. But the more and more kind of time went on, the more and more I realized that, you know, there's going to come a time where everybody is so on fire for the Mass that it will in some ways spill out into the rest of society and the rest of culture that what we experience on Sundays will be so potent and so strong. It's almost like the cup will be so full that it will spill out and overflow. And all through society, all of society will be changed. And <laughs> culture itself could be transformed in a beautiful way, in a beautiful way. And um, I'd been leading worship at a Bible study at our parish that turned into a weekly worship night for Catholics where we were bringing together Catholic students and we were singing worship and a lot of this music was coming from the evangelical world was coming from different denominations there, were, there just weren't a lot of people you know at the time I was a young guy in his late 20s early 30s there was just there was a very small list I had, I had a good friend of mine who was a mentor named Tom Booth he had kind of blazed the trail and before him John Michael Talbot but there wasn't this and part of it you have to understand, because people always say, how come there's not more Catholic worship leaders? I'm like, because there's not enough opportunities. At a non-denominational church, children are raised seeing that writing music that directly talks about and invites the worship of God is actually something that you can do. But at a lot of Catholic parishes, that's just not happening. But I was given the freedom to do it, and so I was, and I was writing songs. And I'd written this song, and I had no idea when I wrote this song what I had written. I had no idea when I wrote it that it would literally change, in some ways, the course of my life. A young man by the name of Chris Tomlin, who's a very, yeah. He's actually, a lot of people don't know this, he's the most sung songwriter in human history. Um. More people are singing the songs that he writes around the world because there's more Christians than anybody else. And so more people are singing the songs that he's writing. A young guy from Grand Saline, Texas, the salt capital of, of the world, wrote these songs. How great is our God, holy is the Lord, forever God is faithful. Bob singing at the end of the Traveler's Mass. And so he had heard this song I'd written, and he, he wanted to record it. And I remember the day I got the email. I'd gotten out of a liturgy planning meeting. I mean, we were talking about probably vestments and trying to figure out where to put all the cups because of liturgical changes or talking about the lector at the 1030 Mass and how they had a horrible lisp. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Could have been anything. But all of a sudden, Chris Tomlin sends this email, and something shifted in me. Something changed. And in 2005, I was invited. He recorded the song in 2004. In 2005, I went to... Uh, a collegiate conference called Passion. It's for college-age students ages 18 to 25. It was started over 25 years ago. And I was invited as a Catholic to come and lead worship a little bit in one of the smaller groups. And it really was the start of building relationships. And these people knew I was somehow connected, but they didn't know how to make sense of it either because they were really Baptist. <laughs> really Baptist. But they're like, we don't, know, we don't know anything about this guy, but this guy's writing songs, and these songs are great. And, and it wasn't even an intentional thing. But during that time, two profound things happened that changed the course of my life, other than Chris recording this song. That started a process 
Ultimately, in Lent of 2005, I did a Bible study for our college-age ministry. And I focused one session on John 17. Those of you aren't familiar with John 17, it's Jesus' high priestly prayer for unity. After he's instituted the Eucharist, on his way up to Gethsemane, they sing a hymn of praise, and Jesus says, Now, Father, the hour has come. And he goes on and lists his amazing prayer, and he says, I pray, Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. I and you and me and them, so that the world may believe. And all of a sudden, my heart was torn wide open because I realized that I never cared about this scripture. I cared so much about being Catholic. I cared so much about making sure people were on fire with their faith. I cared about young people. I cared about college students. But I didn't know any of the other, I didn't know anybody who worked at a church a mile down the road. And I assumed that they didn't really want to know me. And so it just started this process of, God, would you please open my heart? Help me love these people that I don't know anything about, that I've assumed much. I know they assume much. Right at the same time, during Lent, Brother Roger was murdered. Brother Roger was the founder of a community called Taizé, which was an ecumenical community started in France in the late 40s. It was Catholic and Protestant monks. In a special way, their ministry was to young people. And they sang repetitive songs based on the scriptures, usually simple phrases from the Psalms or from other scriptures. And Brother Roger formed a foundationally simple, kind of private, low-key, most people don't know about it, but he had a very profound relationship with St. John Paul II, with Cardinal Casper. His whole community did. And all of a sudden, when I read news of his death and started for some reason, I felt God say, you need to go look at that. And I started researching it. And then I felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to help carry this torch. And so I started looking into what the church teaches about unity. And what's amazing is that when you look back on the past three pontificates, including our current, Pope Francis, and I'm sure if you go back into Pope Paul VI or John the XXIII, Really, with the Second Vatican Council, a lot of things were changed. One of the most amazing things was the view that the church looked at other Christians, including the Orthodox. The phrase separated brethren, it did not even exist before the promulgation of the de de decree on ecumenism. Unitatis red integratio. So John Paul II, when he wrote, Utunum Sint. He says, the unity of all divided humanity is the will of God. Everywhere, large numbers have felt this impulse of grace, and among our separated brethren also, there increases from day to day a movement fostered by the grace of the Holy Spirit for the restoration of unity amongst all Christians. The Catholic Church embraces with hope the commitment to ecumenism as a duty of the Christian conscience, enlightened by faith and guided by love. As a duty. It was never a duty in my world. I never saw it as a duty. I saw it as maybe an option. But he says this in, in paragraph 15, passing from principles, from the obligations of the Christian conscience to the actual practice of the ecumenical, ecumenical journey towards unity, the Second Vatican Council emphasizes, above all, the need for interior conversion. So I was like, oh, so the, first of all, the primary way that I'm going to help bring about unity is my own conversion. Okay, this, make, this totally makes sense. This is tangible. Because I was like, I don't, how, do I, how do I help bring about unity? It feels like such an abstract thing. And Jesus is just like, be holier. Oh, okay, cool. I can do that. And so it really was this process of just me being docile to the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy Spirit, if this is a burden you want to place on my heart, if, if you want to change the ministry that I'm doing right now, go right ahead. And I tell you the most amazing thing, you never have to kick down a door that God opens. You don't. And so it really was this process of a journey. 
along comes Pope Benedict XVI. His last homily, he, which I looked up, you know, Pope Benedict quotes on unity. Last homily, he talks about kind of two important things. He says, I'm thinking in particular, I'm talking about things to pray for during Lent, about sins against the unity of the church, the divisions in the ecclesial body, living Lent in a more intense and evident ecclesial communion, overcoming individualism and rivalry, is a humble and precious sign for those who are far from the faith or indifferent. Overcoming individualism and rivalry is a humble and precious sign for those who are far from the faith or indifferent. I'd realized in my own life how prideful I'd been about my faith. I loved it so much that it actually borderlined on idolatry. Not actually Jesus himself, but being right. And I realized a lot of that f came from my own insecurities, that I didn't feel respected or I didn't feel validated as a Catholic. I didn't feel respected amongst my fellow Christian peers. And so what the Lord said to me is, if you want to be a bridge, you got to lay down and let people walk all over you. I'll say that again. If you want to be a bridge, you have to lay down and let people walk all over you. In the, in the same homily, Pope Benedict XVI, he's talking about the cross. He says, the reconciliation offered to us has cost a high price, that of the cross, the cross raised on Golgotha, on which was hung the Son of God made man. In this immersion of God in human suffering and in the abyss of evil lies the root of our justification. The return to God with all your heart, which you always hear at Ash Wednesday, in our Lenten journey passes through the cross, following Christ on the road to Calvary, the total gift of self. It is a way on which to learn every day to come out more and more from our selfishness and our closures, to make room for God who opens and transforms the heart. So focusing on the cross actually helps us come outside of ourselves. So gradually my songwriting started to shift. Not because I wasn't passionate about the things that I believed as a Catholic, but because there was a sense the Holy Spirit was saying, this is important for the day and age in which we live. It's important for the time because we have never been in a more narcissistic time in all of human history. And what is needed is people to journey with their narcissism and find Christ waiting in the middle of it, leading them through that, through the cross, through the death of self, and out into the world. Isn't it amazing that that's how Lent in 2013 started? And here's how Lent ended. Living Holy Week following Jesus, not only with the emotions of heart, Living Holy Week following Jesus means learning how to come out of ourselves. As I said on Sunday, to reach out to others, to go to the outskirts of existence, to be the first to move towards our brothers and sisters, especially those who are most distant, those who are forgotten, those who are most need of understanding, consolation, and help. There's so much need to bring the living presence of Jesus, merciful and full of love. That's Pope Francis literally carrying the baton of a sentence that's been started back at the Second Vatican Council. And still this baton is being carried through the ministry of Peter. Trying to say to the church and to the world, the way of reconciliation, the way of unity is through the cross. It's through the reconciliation of believers, which will then lead to the reconciliation of the world. I'm so convinced of this, that the day and age in which we live, what the world needs more than anything, is a living sign of unity through the church. Visible, visible signs. We will never come to agreement at a podium arguing with one another. And here's how I know why. This following quote from Pope Francis. Weary from his journey, Jesus does not hesitate to ask the Samaritan woman for something to drink. His thirst, however, is much more than physical. It is a thirst for encounter, a desire to enter into dialogue with that woman and to invite her to make a journey of interior conversion. Jesus is patient, respectful of the person before him, and gradually reveals himself to her. His example encourages us to seek a serene encounter with others, to understand one another, to grow in charity and truth. We need to pause to accept and listen to one another 
In this way, we already begin to experience unity. Unity grows along the way. It never stands still. Unity happens when we walk together. I truly believe the church is on a pilgrimage. That's the language that we were given in the Second Vatican Council. But it's not even that. It goes all the way back to the patristic age. Dr. Hahn and I were talking about this earlier, that this is the legacy that we have as Catholics, is that we are on this journey caught in the now and not yet, and yet we still, we actually do have the not yet now in the Eucharist. Yet there's still this tension that we live in of what we're not perfect, and there are these divisions. But that's why we go to the altar. That's why we go to the throne of grace for timely help so that we can start to experience tangibly union with Christ, which can bring about union with the church, which can bring about unity in the world. So when we talk about how do you present your faith in this world that we live in, you know, literary, literacy rates are dropping incredibly fast. My son, he's four years old, Images mean more to him than words. And for his generation, they will. So how do you transmit an orally-based tradition to a visually-based culture? The, the primary way is to be a saint. It's what it's always been. But it's saints rooted, I think, in humility. I made a new album, Saints and Sinners, and it's not a plug for the album. I'm going to plug the saints that are on it because I feel like they're important for this time to intercede for us as a church. St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Francis of Assisi, Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And um, Blessed, or is it Venerable or Blessed Oscar Romero? It's Blessed. I wrote, I had no idea when I wrote a song based on his life, that that was what's going to happen. I was just praying at a time of transition in my life and figuring, Lord, how do I witness to this world? It's just getting so crazy. And I feel like what the Lord reminded me was that the greatest treasure that we have to share in terms of the Christian life, it is the legacy and the witness of the saints. And what we need are more and more humble witnesses. Brothers and sisters, why is the world so fascinated with Pope Francis? It's not because he says ambiguous things that the media can misinterpret. That's not why he's so fascinating. He's fascinating because he's a humble servant of Jesus. In 2006, he was at a gathering. There was a gathering sponsored in Argentina. It involved evangelical ministers, the charismatic renewal, and they invited at the time Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio. They had to get his permission. Catholicism is the only legal recognized form of Christianity in Latin America. They had to get his permission. And, of course, he said, absolutely, on one condition, you'll let me speak. And they said, oh, absolutely. We'd love to, your eminence. So the day comes, and there's all these sort of evangelical ministers. They're all standing on stage, and everyone's praying. And Father Inero Contalmes is there, who's the Vatican household preacher, who's just a spitfire. Even at the age he's at, he's just, it's amazing the ministry that God's given him. And Everyone's preaching and they're worshiping God together. It's amazing. And they're like, okay, it's time for the cardinal to speak. And they're like, where is he? I don't know. He wasn't on stage. They're like, where, where is he? And he was. So all of a sudden they realize he's in the back of the room hanging out with people. And during the sign of peace, there was a sign of reconciliation. He starts walking around to all these people. He says, on behalf of the Catholic Church, I'm so sorry if we've ever hurt you. I'm so sorry if we've misrepresented Christ. We love you. We're so glad you're here. So they find him, and they're embarrassed. They're like, what, well, the cardinal's all the way down. So they, they bring him up. They're like, we say a prayer. He's like, absolutely. And he says, how good is it that we're here together? That even in the midst of our divisions, we could celebrate what Jesus is doing. And it, he's actually part of a small group with two other evangelical ministers. They'd get together once a month. They'd pray. They'd read the Bible. They'd talk about their faith life. And so he asks what he always asks, as he says humbly, he says, will you please pray for me? And they said, okay. And he's like, and they're like, yeah, right now. So he humbly knelt 
on the stage. And you can find it if you give it a Google. This picture of a cardinal who would become pope. And he's being prayed over by evangelicals. What a powerful symbol. It's something that you and I could not even imagine that God would do. Could you imagine 15 years ago that the video would circulate about Kenneth Copeland, who's praying for the Pope? Could you, could you imagine that that's happening? Yet, yet somehow this is a work of the Holy Spirit that God is orchestrating that is larger than all of us. And the way that he wants to call us to respond is always first and foremost through our individual sanctity, but that also means, which is where I want to kind of leave it before uh, the Q&A, is just to ask you the question, are there people in your life that you need to be reconciled with? Are there non-Catholics, friends, that you've never thought about praying for, that you've never reached out try to be an olive branch. It could actually, in fact, I know, it's part of all of our, sanct of our sanctification. It's part of the process of us being the saints that we're called to be. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you are so good. We love you so much. Father, I thank you for the richness and the traditions that we have as the people of God. I thank you for the Eucharist. I thank you for the sacraments. I thank you for our Blessed Mother. I thank you for all the saints, the deposit of faith. God, more than ever now, we need all the grace from that to equip us to be the saints of the third millennium. In a special way, we ask for an increase in just the spirit of humility and service to walk with those who you're asking us to walk with. Mary, I do ask for your intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace.